next Saturday night. We're sending you back to the future. Okay, all right. Saturday's good. Saturday's good. A little over a year ago, I made a video on a somewhat obscure NES game called Star Tropics. Now, normally I would tell you to go watch it, but it was my first video, so it, uh, it sucks. So, basically, I thought it was a very fun, charming, and challenging little adventure game that has become one of my favorites on the NES. It's something I highly recommend you try one day if you haven't already. But that's not what we're here to discuss, of course. In 1994, Nintendo IRD developed a sequel entitled Zoda's Revenge Star Tropics 2. This was released in 1994, which was really late into the Super Nintendo's life. It was a part of a campaign to keep the NES alive. They released a new model of the NES and continued to publish high profile games such as Kirby's Adventure, Mega Man 6, and our game in question, Star Tropics 2. It ended up not selling all that well and got decent at best reviews from critics at the time. Plus, people had moved on to the SNES and Sega Genesis by this point, so this game wasn't on people's radar. Not to say the first game was on everyone's radar either, but I digress. Even now, people don't really bring up the sequel all that much. It's always the first game. So is this second entry worth remembering? Or should we leave it in the dust? This is Zoda's Revenge, Star Tropics 2. The game starts up with Mike receiving a telepathic call from Mika, who is the princess of the alien race we saved in the first game. She gives us a code that needs to be deciphered. Mike then sees if Dr. J can crack the code. It reveals an ancient spell that, when recited, sends Mike back in time. We then end up all the way back in caveman times. After finishing the first dungeon, you come across a stone. Mika then informs us that it is a tetrad. Yeah, this game's collectibles are a bunch of tetris pieces. Well, they've definitely kept that quirkiness of the first game, thankfully. A funny thing is, in the virtual console release of this game, they're just called blocks because of copyright issues regarding the tetris brand. But they probably could have thought of something a little more creative than that. But anyway. Mike is instructed to travel through various time periods and seek out the Tetrads. For some reason, it's not really explained why we're doing this until the very end, but it's nothing to get worked up over, really. I mean, this is an NES game where you're collecting Tetris blocks, I think we can cut it some slack. Later on in your adventure, Zoda returns and tries to steal a Tetrad. Apparently, there are three forms of Zoda lurking around, so now Mike has to stop him, along with getting all the Tetrads. So yeah, this game is all about time travel. You visit several places, such as Egypt, London, and the Wild Wild West. While in these different places, you encounter several famous people throughout history, like Cleopatra, Leonardo da Vinci, and even some fictional characters like Sherlock Holmes. And while all these locations do take the tropics out of Star Tropics, I honestly don't mind. All these radically different locations add a ton of visual variety to this game that I quite like. While I did enjoy the peaceful yet adventurous vibe of the first game, I gotta hand it to the sequel. These overworlds are vastly more interesting than the ones in the previous game. There, the environments were very bare bones. They didn't look all that remarkable, and there wasn't much to do aside from talking to the locals. But here in Zelda's Revenge, that's pretty much the opposite. These overworlds look really nice for NES and are quite detailed, which is something I was glad to see. Not only that, but the dialogue is far better here. The writing is far more interesting and fleshed out this time around, keeping the cutscenes decently engaging. Even the random NPCs were decently entertaining. The first game's humor was very comparable to the Mother series with its more subdued and unobtrusive jokes. Here in the sequel we get way zanier jokes, which I'm all for. Nonsensical humor is something I find really entertaining when done well, and while this isn't Ren and Stimpy, you still encounter a ton of wacky scenarios. While in Ancient Egypt, for example, a Cleopatra tells you to go get a pizza and bring it to her because the one she ordered was running late. It's so ridiculous in the best way. Another example is in the Wild West. You find a chicken nugget instead of a gold nugget and Mike just eats it right off the ground. It's, it's perfect. The things you do in the overworld are far better as well. It's more involved this time. 
I mean, it's still basic, but that's besides the point. But here you'll find yourself exploring the environments and engaging with characters more here. My favorite example of this has to be a part in Ancient Egypt. The entrance to a pyramid you have to enter is blocked by a force field, and you need a special ability to get past it. You're instructed to find this grassy area and go through a maze. While on the surface you can't see the path so you have to frequently get up on these platforms to look above the maze and see the path. It's a fun challenge and it was a really nice change of pace considering it was right after a dungeon. The Wild West is pretty cool too. You have to bomb some walls in order to find a path to a tetrad. However, the said path isn't obvious. What you have to do is ask a musician in the local saloon to play a song for you. If you pay attention to the lyrics, it turns out to be directions to the tetrad. I thought that was an extremely clever puzzle. I'd say the only real issue I have with the overworlds is the music. I didn't say this much in my review, but I absolutely adored the first game's soundtrack. It had a very chill and upbeat feel while simultaneously keeping an adventurous tone. It was great stuff, some of the best on the NES honestly. But here, I don't know, but they're way more bland this time around. Now, some of them are pretty good, like the Wild West music, the track that plays when you're talking to Sherlock Holmes, and the main dungeon theme is fantastic. But other than that, the tracks weren't memorable whatsoever. They're not bad at all, just kind of boring, you know? They really could have used more flair. It's odd because Yoshio Hiari... Hiar... Hiri... <sighs> Yoshio Hirai. That guy, who is the first game's composer, returned for this installment. Although there was one extra composer, so maybe he was responsible for the lackluster soundtrack? I don't know. So aside from the music in most places, these overworld portions are pretty fantastic all things considered. They're a vast improvement on the originals, and the originals weren't even bad to begin with, so it all checks out. But of course, that's only one portion of what this game has to offer, but unfortunately these dungeons were a major disappointment. So allow me to explain just why that is. But first I'd like to briefly say why the original game's dungeons worked so well. They had a great balance between combat and light puzzle solving that kept the player engaged and challenged. They were also designed around a strict grid which in retrospect probably forced them to get more creative. Sure level tropes were repeated but it was never that apparent. They also had a ton of neat gimmicks in these dungeons that switched things up. It was nothing groundbreaking or anything but it was fun and that's all that matters. But in Zelda's Revenge there's almost none of that to be found. One thing that's immediately noticeable are the controls. Instead of keeping the original control scheme of the first game, they adopted something more traditional. They also ditched the grid-based structure of the dungeons. You can move Mike in 8 directions and even maneuver him during a jump. I honestly don't have a big deal with these controls, although they did feel a bit slippery at first, but I got used to it in no time. However, the jumping is very, very awkward. It's kind of hard to explain, but it feels both too stiff and too lightweight at the same time. It can be hard to judge your jumps here. I found myself undershooting my jumps a lot, which led to some frustrating moments from time to time. But back to the normal movement, I think this was done so the game could be a bit more accessible for some. See, at the time, critics complained about the unconventional controls of the first Star Tropics, so it seemed like a logical move on the developer's part. It also makes combat just a bit smoother here. You can definitely dodge things more easily. But that leads me into why these dungeons fail. There's so much focus on combat this time around. The first two dungeons are essentially just enemy gauntlets. Room after room of combat with some mediocre platforming elements sprinkled in there. It's just boring. Nothing exciting goes on. There's hardly any element of puzzle, just mindless fighting. And the fighting isn't much to write home about in the first place. It really left a bad first impression. Although there was one puzzle in the first dungeon that I just have to mention. So you're in caveman times and you enter a cave where everyone lives. Off in the far right corner there's a cave painting. But nobody knows what it means, it's ju just a series of symbols. I thought it might turn up again, but I didn't really think much of it. Well, it turns out that near the end of the dungeon you're faced with this room. Recognize those symbols? Yeah, you have to enter the correct doors by following that exact pattern. Now, what if you didn't see the painting? What if you didn't write it down like I did? Well, you're out of luck. And sure, maybe I should have used my brain and copied it down, but there was absolutely no indication that I should have remembered it in the first place. And like I said, you might not even see it. It's pretty ridiculous if you ask me. Not only that, but if you go in the wrong door, 
you're forced to exit the dungeon and do it all again. It's dumb. But these days, we of course have the internet, which gives us access to all the porn, I mean information, that we could ever want, so it doesn't matter much anymore, but back in the 90s, it was a different story. But thankfully, the second dungeon in Egypt is actually pretty fantastic. It provides a good balance of combat, a puzzle, and platforming all in a fun package. It legitimately feels like an evolved version of the first game's dungeons in a way. It's very solid and got me thinking that the game would start picking up. But I was wrong. The next two dungeons after aren't too special. They're just... okay. They never elaborate on any gimmicks presented and end up relying on combat way too much yet again. Like, there's this part in the Wild West dungeon where these wooden spikes pop out of the walls so you have to carefully move forward. Pretty neat, right? Well, it never shows up again. Sometimes they just never use a gimmick to its full potential like these conveyor belts. They don't feel very significant and aren't used very creatively. And the dungeons towards the end aren't any better. They go back on that enemy gauntlet design in full force. But this time, every enemy hits like a tank, making things pretty obnoxious. Now the first game did suffer from a frustrating late game as well, so it's nothing really new. But I'm gonna complain about it anyway. However, I'm gonna toss the game a compliment real quick. My biggest issue with the first game was thankfully dealt with, that being your health management. The hearts and potions are much more plentiful this time around. They're not handed to you on a silver platter or anything, but they're more common nonetheless. And your health capacity is increased at the end of each dungeon Zelda style, which is greatly appreciated. But because these enemies hit so hard, you won't have much health a lot of the time, meaning you'll be hearing that beeping constantly. Invincibility frames are also practically non-existent in this game, leading to you getting stuck on enemies sometimes. And as for the boss fights, they're even worse. They're extremely frustrating since so much stuff is being thrown at you constantly that it's impossible to dodge all of it most of the time. I kinda hated them, but I think that's enough ranting about the dungeons. So let's move on to, to the ending portion of the game. After you nab the last tetrad, Mika calls you once again and informs you that there's trouble back at Sea Island, which was a location from the first game. So Mike returns to the present, and it turns out that everyone in Coral Cola has been turned into wild boars by Zoda. The final dungeon is actually a recreation of the first dungeon from the original game, which is a nice callback. But the best part about this is actually the boss fight. Back in Star Tropics 1, the dungeon's boss was a giant snake that you attack by shooting fire into its mouth, eventually burning off its skin, leaving behind the skeleton. Well, the boss in the recreated dungeon is that skeleton, which I thought was a pretty cool touch. Though the fun it doesn't quite last. See, afterwards you have to go through a boss rush. Now I don't have a problem with boss rushes, but there is a big issue here. Like I said earlier, the boss fights in Star Trek 2 are pretty bad. Due to the constant attacks, they end up becoming endurance tests. So with this boss rush, they essentially made an endurance test out of endurance tests. And it sucks. Now you are given a plethora of hearts and potions, so that's good, but they won't last. It's all pretty unnecessary and the game really didn't need it. Though it was kind of fun mowing down the earlier bosses with a fully charged psychic attack. The final fight with the Zoda isn't much better. I mean, the first phase is okay, if a bit long. He just shoots projectiles at you and can even turn you into a boar, which was pretty funny, I'll admit. But the second phase is simply ridiculous. Look at all of this, how are you supposed to, to survive this? Not only that, if you die during the Zoda fight, you don't just restart the fight with him. Oh, no, no, no. You have to redo the entire boss rush. Why? That just wastes everyone's time. I'll be honest here, I turned on an invincibility cheat for this fight because I was just fed up playing this game by the end and I just wanted it to be over. But I could tell the fight was garbage anyway. After he's defeated, the residents of Coral Cola turn back to normal. And you know, I quite enjoyed seeing a Coral Cola with updated visuals, though it also reminded me of how much better the first game is. But anyway, Mike and the Argonians meet up and decide to finally put the Tetrads together. They end up summoning the Argonian King, and he just thanks Mike for bringing him back. The end. What? Again, I don't really care about the story of this game at all, but come on. Throughout the whole game, you're basically collecting MacGuffins with absolutely no knowledge of what they do. It's kinda dumb, but again, it doesn't really matter, but I just wanted to point it out. 
So, that was uh, Star Tropics 2. And yeah, I didn't like this game very much. It does have its strengths. The zany humor, the characters, the visuals, the overworlds are fun to explore. And there are a lot of memorable moments, I will say. But the core aspect of this game, that being the dungeons, are very lacking. Yes, a couple of them are decent. Um, they look pretty good, and some of the anime designs are pretty cool. But the actual design is just boring, and frustrating, and boring. A lot of the time it just amounts to a waves and waves of enemies, with the bits of clunky overhead platforming sprinkled in there. It's just not that much fun. They're by no means awful, but they don't hold a candle to the first game's dungeons with how they incorporated fun puzzles and environment interaction with combat. And even when looking at the sequel on its own merits, it's just an average action-adventure game for the NES, and nothing more. I doubt I'll ever really return to this game, but hey, if you enjoyed the first game, then by all means, go ahead and give this a try. You might give a more out of it than me. Who knows? Stop watching those wig commercials! I can even shower with it! And there's Soda's Revenge, Star Tropics 2, where you battle Soda, the man with no face. No more mommy soaps for you! As teardrops fall... So, thank Granny! Oh. Cash the checks and get the NES! You have watched too much TV already.